Hello, mere mortals. We're kicking off with another book review. And today I have for you Disgrace by J.M. Coetze. Before I begin, I'm going to tell you that this book is a difficult read. It touches on some very disturbing themes. I probably wouldn't recommend this for kids or for people who have uh, undergone, I guess, some traumatic events because it really does touch upon some deep themes. And it's, it's not pleasant to read. It really isn't pleasant to read. So I'm just going to dive right into it. This book was published in 1999 and it was awarded the Booker Prize for this novel and the Nobel Prize in Literature in 2013. Now, I think it's a good to talk a little bit about the author first because it gives a bit of a background to, to the book and maybe some of the experiences of why he wrote it and what he was trying to convey in it. So he grew up in South Africa and lived through the apartheid era. So if you know what apartheid is, was obviously when the, the South African black people didn't have as many rights as the South African whites descended from uh, the Netherlands, I believe. And there was this, I guess, intense period of struggle. So think of Nelson Mandela in jail. And there was lots of acts of violence. There was lots of tension in the country, lots of bad things, poverty, lots of bad things all sort of accumulating into just this one era, which was you know, known as the apartheid era. Now, this book is told through the eyes of David Lurie as he experiences a disgrace and then inability to protect his own daughter, Lucy. So I'll go for a quick, 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 quick recount of the book. Basically, David Lurie is a professor in some sort of like obscure English language in a, um, in a university and he sleeps with one of his students, a young 20-year-old girl, something like that. He is then forced out of the university and goes to live with his daughter on her farm out in the outskirts of, I think it's outside of Johannesburg, something like that. And he lives with her and I guess it's like a combination of his gr growing acceptance, to needing to live with her, his uh, her independence from him and her almost irrational view of, of wanting to stay out there and why she wants to stay out there. Uh, where they experience some very traumatic events. And I guess the, the book just follows his progression through this short period of, I'm guessing it's like a couple of months in his life, uh, but touches upon some other, th you know, older portions of his life. Now, the themes in the book, I'm just going to lead through, uh, read through a couple here that were contained within. So sexual misconduct, sexual desire, growing old, impatience, race relations, creating art, rape, animal rights. It touches upon a lot of themes, even though it's a relatively short book. It only has about 220 pages. And I think it's, you know, it's hard to deal with all of these individually. And you probably could, you know, write entire essays on, oh, this is what, you know, the author was trying to explain. This occurred because of this way. And that's interesting, but I'm going to narrow it down to the, I suppose, like the two main ones that I found throughout the book. So, Number one was sexual desire and, and I guess what it actually is. Now, to begin, I'm going to just say that thankfully, thankfully, the author didn't mention love in the story. It was just purely eros, sexual desire, which would have just complicated everything a hundred times more. Love is a very complicated word. So it was nice to see that he only stuck to the theme of sexual desire. And there are many instances that, occur for this the the story actually starts with david lurie visiting a prostitute and i guess his like connection with her and their connection with each other based around the sexual desire and when he sees her and her fam her family it's it's almost like the connection is lost because something is taken away from the the pureness of what was and is now introduced into another context now, he's pretty unapologetic about his desire and acting upon it as well. So even though he has some momentaneous reflections of like, mm, maybe I shouldn't be sleeping with my student here, he he goes ahead with it anyway and does face the consequences for that. But he's very unapologetic about it. He always says, look, this my sexual desire is an innate, unchangeable thing, essentially. I follow its whims and I almost like follow it to completion not not really 
trying to, uh, I guess, explain it or say or or even say sorry for it. It's he, he's more like this is an innate thing in me. I can't change it, and so what is wrong with me following it? As long as I'm not, you know, hurting people, or as long as it's consensual, I guess. And uh, you know, there's there's a point to that. There is a point to that, but there is a, a very fine line between acting upon your sexual desires and then the implications that it that it can actually have as well because it is such a it's such a, a hard topic to talk about sex is is a very very hard topic one and i don't particularly talk about it on here on on mere mortals because I, I guess it's maybe a little bit personal for us but also i think just because i don't think either of us are particularly good at explaining it and it's not something that we've had a lot of practice doing as well in the sense of explaining it. Um, I can't speak for Juan, but it's, it, it definitely is just a topic that incites a lot of emotions very rapidly and very strong emotions as well. Um, and I guess one of the questions I, I came out with the book was what level of power relations are acceptable? And this is a pretty difficult one because there's just just so much that goes on with it. So in this instance, I'm thinking of a, a very powerful man sleeping with a younger student or someone who has direct influence over and can affect other parts of their lives through their actions. So also in this category would be the CEO sleeping with the intern or, um, you know, just those those things like that, The the swim coach with his with his student or something where it's, you have a very strong um, ability to affect the other person's life in both positive and negative ways. And, you know, we've seen a lot of this with the, I guess, like the me too movement, the Harvey Weinstein and whatnot. And that was an obvious case where he was essentially raping these girls. But there are also cases where, power is can be a very seductive thing as well not just for men but for women as well and the, you know the reason a lot of people go get to these sort of unbelievably powerful positions of putting in 100 hour work weeks for years and years decades of their lives to re- reach these powerful positions is cuz they want the benefits of it and one of the benefits of it is that people are attracted to power so Let's just take this case for example. What what do we do when it's a situation where a student is attracted to a teacher because of the fact he is her teacher? If she just met this guy normally outside on the street, like it wouldn't matter. She should probably just blow this guy off. Well, like, whatever. He's just some middle aged man. But when it's in that context of her being the student and him having power over her grades, his ability to affect her future. And she's attracted to that. You know, what do you do in a situation like that? And I I certainly don't have the answers for that. I think as a general principle, I would entirely stick away from that. And I've always recommended my friends, like, don't mix work and relationships, for example, because I just just see that always ending negatively. I I never see the, the real positive sides of that. And I guess when we're just talking about sexual desire here, it, that that would probably be where I'd be, I'd put my foot down and say like, look, if it's just about sexual desire, then you shouldn't you shouldn't engage in these activities. If it's about love, which is a much more deeper, you know, long term connection sort of thing, that's maybe to the stage where I would say, okay, if you love this other person, then maybe it it might be worth talking about is it possible to have the CEO with his intern, they love each other, still working in the same company? I would probably say no. And and that's where I would say, like, if you're really in love with each other, something's got to change. One of you has to leave your position. So when it it comes to that mixing of sexual desire and power, I I probably tend more to the the side of saying it's, it's not acceptable just because that yeah that that mixing up of of such strong emotional acts such as the the act of sex and something that might be need to be more logical reasoned and thoughtful such as giving person a certain grade 
or deciding who should advance next in the company or things like that, that's probably where you should separate those two. And, uh, you know, for me, I, I would say that that's probably the best course of action, but what do I know? The other theme that I really wanted to talk about was obviously disgrace. The book is called disgrace. I'm going to talk about disgrace. So the loss of reputation, um, this is the definition, the loss of reputation or respect as a result of a dishonorable action. So that's what disgrace is defined as. Now in the book, there's a big juxtaposition between accepting responsibility and not with reference to grace, uh, disgrace, as well as something that's causal and something that's incidental. So I'll start with expect, uh, accepting responsibility and not. How is disgrace different if the person accepts it or not accepts it? We can see in the book where he he doesn't accept essentially the... I, I think one of the things that David Lurie in the book gets well is it's fine to have your convictions and say, I'm not going to accept this. I believed it was right to sleep with that student there was obviously negative outcomes from this because he did do some things that were bad, such as altering her grades, such as causing her to to almost have like a a loss of identity, of a loss of self, a judgment from her peers, from everyone who is in her social circle looking at her and then they start to question like, oh, okay, she did this only because she wanted the good grades. She did this because she wanted the, the power. She didn't actually love this guy or actually feel sexual desire towards him. And it, it is difficult because while reading the book, the scene where he you know makes love to her definitely has a lot of ambiguity as to whether she consented to it or not. It's, it's very difficult to tell whether she did or not. And so that sort of, disgrace caused by something like that where he he didn't accept responsibility for it and then a disgrace where you actually internally feel bad for it is is something quite different and i think when you don't accept responsibility for it it's actually much much easier to almost live with it in a way obviously because you don't you don't feel all the bad things but you still will get the negative outcomes for that so he had to accept, okay, I have to leave the university because I'm essentially getting fired because I did have improper conducts with one of my students. So there's a big difference. I think it's almost like the internal the internal acceptance of it or the internal battles with your own emotions and what you're feeling is easier if you're if you're not accepting of it, but you also have to accept that if you, if you don't accept it, there's still going to be consequences for your outcomes. And so he, he sort of accepted both. He accepted like uh, there would be these bad consequences. I'm going to have to leave my job. I'm going to have to go elsewhere. I'm not welcome in my community anymore because I'm not accepting of, of their judgment. And then there's maybe the other way around where you can be accepting of, of, this, of the disgrace but not accepting of the of the outcomes for it. So, you know, he could have said, you know, I did the wrong thing. I did the bad thing. And then the outcomes from it, he could say, no, I don't accept like internally saying not accepting it. The difference there is obviously in the real world, things happen to you and <laughs> you can't deny reality. If, if you get fired from your job, it doesn't matter how much you don't accept it. It's still going to happen. So, there's that one. Then there's also the the causal and the incidental. So things, and this ties into it. So it's easier, I think, to accept things that have. Actually, no, maybe it's not easier. So in in the book, there's two incidents. One which is causal. So the 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 incident with the student, he caused it to happen. He was well aware of what was going on when it was ha happening, and he chose to it. And then the incidental, which was the the scene of rape with his daughter, where basically him and his daughter are, are living in this farm in the outskirts, and three three black men come along. Oh, sorry, two black men and a sort of child come along, rape her, beat him up, lock him, set him on like 
pour kerosene on him, set him on fire. And that was like incidental. Neither he nor his daughter caused that to happen. Uh, yet the disgrace was very strong. The shame for them was very strong still, especially for the daughter. She very, very much struggled accepting what had happened and almost like moving on with her life. Whereas in the other one where he caused it, sleeping with the student, it was almost easier in a way, which is very strange because you'd think it would actually be the opposite. You'd think, okay, I caused this to happen. So, you know, it's, it's going to be hard for me to accept that because it was like a different me doing that. And then there's the me now, which is suffering the consequences. Whereas something like rape, where it's, you know, they didn't want it to happen. It just happened. It's very hard to accept it. And that's just a, a very strange thing of human psychology. I'd never really thought of that before. The The other question that comes from this is, I guess, how do we recover nowadays um, with technology? Obviously, this stuff gets put up everywhere. It's, it's very strongly on the internet. It sticks around forever. People will know. If they search your name up in Google, they will know. They will find it out. And... It's, it's very hard and it sort of doesn't matter what level it is. It could be a very minor thing or it could be a gigantic thing. You could have stolen $10 from work or you could have embezzled $100 million from your company. You know, sort of both will get out there in a sense. And the recovery process is, is interesting. I'm not really sure exactly what it is, but I think it's something to do with time. Time and attention. You just have to let it time play its course if you've done something disgraceful or shameful, it's almost like there's, you know, maybe it's something we should set up as society, some limits. Okay, you, and we do that in a sense with with regards to criminal activities, but disgrace is a bit different because it's it's not usually a criminal activity. It's something that's, you know, just below that line of of ethics and morality where we've put a hard limit to it. You killed someone, you go to jail, but what if you watch someone get murdered and you didn't say it to anyone i'm not that could be a law uh, i'm not actually sure but what what do you do then and and then people find out like oh you saw this this girl getting murdered and you didn't tell the police that's you know that's a very good cause for question of why you did that and maybe you should get shamed for that maybe you you know are you so do you not feel emotions that all the rest of us feel what what is that like so it's a tough one it's a tough one and i'm not sure how you recover nowadays i think it's something to do with time and attention and getting off of social media probably is is, is probably one of the best ways the other question was what did you do with the person who's unrepentant so they do something such like in the book with david laurie where he he sleeps with a student and then doesn't apologize for it says that it it was a fine it was a just thing to do what do you do with people like that it's do you ostracize them do you keep them around but not interact with them the same way how do you change your level of interaction with that person or connection with that person i think that's an ind what an individual needs to think about and what you should what you should do as an individual to to decide what you will do in essence it's almost like you need to have some introspection and thought about it so that you're not just going along with whatever the mob does you're not going along with okay this person says this about this person i'm just going to join in with it it probably needs to be a more personal interaction so <sighs> This is a difficult book. <laughs> it was a difficult book to to read, to talk about as well. I uh, I definitely am struggling a little bit with this, but those were the two main themes that I got out for it and uh, now some of my observations. So great writing, I believe, makes you instantly empathize with the main character and their point of view. I didn't particularly like David Laurie and if I take, take a step back and look, back, look at him, I say, man, this guy's a pretty big piece of shit. I don't think I like his style of communicating with others, how he views others, his the way he views the world, I, I believe is pretty negative. And it's just someone who I think if I met in person, I'd go, no, I don't like you. But, 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 I think great writing 
can make you empathize with the person and put yourself in their shoes. And this is what this book does. You, you, you see through, see through the eyes of David Laurie and, and you, and you see, okay, I, I could sort of see how maybe I could get in that situation. I can sort of see why I would do those things. And yeah, just kudos to the, to the author, J.M. Coetzee for, for being able to do that. The tragedy of being a parent and seeing your child slip away from you as well is, is a, another theme in the book, which was, I found intriguing that that balance between when you're a parent of holding the child super close and loving them with all you have that unconditional love, but also being able to let them go and not holding on too tight so that they are free to form their own opinions of the world and be their own person. That must be very, very difficult. I, I, I can't believe that l most of humanity is able to do this <laughs> and that we haven't, you know, all killed ourselves yet by, by, by absolutely messing this up. So, uh, yeah, it's just a, an interesting thought of, I guess, what, what's, what's the correct level? And there probably is no correct level. It depends on the individual, depends on the amount of, uh, you know, their, their characteristics, your own characteristics, but it's, it's certainly a interesting topic to go down. And then the last one, my last observation was bad things can and do happen. And I think that's a necessary reminder. I've been in Australia for the past year and a bit since traveling almost getting to two years now and Australia is a wonderful place the very very bad things happen very rarely and I did see bad things happen while overseas and I saw the the levels of of poverty that can occur in the world and uh, you know it's this is a bit of a different case because this book talks about you know a, a rape a sexual assault and things like that which are are very extreme examples and I think it's just necessary to, to remind myself like that can happen anywhere that that could happen to me could happen to my family could happen to my loved ones and you know it's almost like reminding myself of that if it ever did happen would still be absolutely devastating but maybe it would be the difference between me absolutely spiraling out of control because you know, something truly terrible happened versus me having an absolutely terrible time feeling like shit, but not, not doing something super, super stupid, something like that. So in summary, it's a quick read that is very, very uncomfortable in many parts, such as you'll hear about old men having sex. You'll see a very graphic rape scene. And I didn't even talk about the euthanizing of the dogs and the, the sort of animal rights part of it, which was also very, very hard to read, not, not something um, I particularly enjoyed reading. So, but it was a useful book and it was a well-written book, which I do appreciate. So overall, Jam Coetzee's Disgrace, I'm giving a 6.5 out of 10. What's something pragmatic I'm going to take from the book? Well, it reminded me of, one scene in particular reminded me of The Gift of Fear by Gavin De Becker, which talks about fear and how you use that and when it is useful to recognize that your fear is actually telling you something. You're a, it's almost like an instinct, uh, an emotion that is very, very useful if you use it in the right way. And there was a scene in the book just in particular where it reminded me of another scene from uh, Gavin De Becker's book, which was essentially a woman got into a lift with a... Um, a woman was going down uh, from her work to to the basement floor, so a couple of floors. In the man in the lift was a um, a man, a black man, and she was initially hesitant, fearful, skeptical, but decided to override those consciously override those innate feelings, those instincts, and get in, into the lift with the man because she didn't want to appear racist. Unfortunately for her, um, I believe that ended up in a sexual assault where she did get raped. And there was a very similar thing in the book here where three uh, these three black men come up to the property where David and his daughter Lucy are and they have dogs with them outside of the cage like Dobermans or, or very, you know, guard dogs, attack dogs. And she intentionally puts them in the cage to sort of project that she is in control of the situation and that she's not fearful. 
unfortunately, this is a very bad idea because that's when the rape actually happens afterwards. So I think it's important to, there are certain situations where you need to run the risk of appearing in a bad light, appearing that you're racist, that you're sexist, that you're homophobic, that you're whatever, because your safety is at concern. And it's important to recognize the difference between those situations where that's entirely unacceptable and those situations where it is acceptable. And I think that's just, uh, yeah, so don't allow your prejudice to do, let you to do silly things. If, if you're very uncomfortable, if the situation feels bad, you should be taking steps which might, from an outsider's point of view, look um, prejudiced or silly or unacceptable. But, you know, when your safety is at, con- at, at, at risk, or potentially at risk, that's where you need to make those decisions. So that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed. Leave a comment, leave a review, share this. If, if you know someone who's read this book and they think they'd enjoy the review or is thinking of reading this book or enjoys books in general, I'd appreciate it if you could share this with them. But other than that, I'll leave it for today. Karen out.